Chris Hardwick, CompuCycle, shout out, tell my boss I was working today. Okay, uh, Ben, I want y'all to meet Ben and give him a big Texas welcome. He's from Idaho, so he's not familiar with Texans. Clap, 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 clap. All right, Ben is a CIE researcher. Bask in the glow as you come across the stage. A deference to Ben, okay. Um, he is from, as we said, Idaho. We've renamed your state, Idaho National Laboratory. Ben specializes in cyber-informed engineering and previously held academic positions where he received recognition for his teaching. He has extensive experience in OT infrastructure and engineering, and he also used to serve in the Navy. Not as good as the Army, but Navy's pretty good. So. <laughs> And everybody also give a big hua <laughs> for the Navy. Hua is really for Army, but we'll give it to them. I know, right? 14 years. Um, so give a big shout out to the Navy and thank you for your service, Ben. And we're looking forward to your presentation. Just want to correct one. Well, I was not actually in. The, I was contracted the Navy. A civilian contractor. We'll take you. You yes. can be the redheaded stepchild yes. of the Navy. But. I, I, yeah, I hung out with the sailors almost as much as they hung out with themselves. So. Don't tell me anything you're going to have to yeah. kill me for. Yes. But the running joke with the Navy, you know what it stands for, right? Never again volunteer yourself. So. Yes. Okay. okay, on that that's note. That's how much that's what happens when you hang out with sailors. You get all those. You better those stick sayings. with OT. Yes. You better stick yes. with OT. I agree. Well, welcome everyone. So uh, it's been interesting being here for the last two days and hanging out because it's very much a cybersecurity conference and I'm coming as an engineer into this space. So I've got an interesting career where I start as an engineer who went into IT to help solve a solution and then ran back to engineering because I like the objectivity of engineering and the, the, the subjectivity of cyber is a very interesting game. But I think, um, I'll just leave it at that. So what I'm gonna talk about today is cyber-informed engineering for microgrids. So why I talk about in the context of microgrids, this idea of cyber-informed engineering is applicable to the engineering discipline. And it really focuses on engineers' role in contributing to the security of a system. And you'll see how it complements kind of our traditional cyber so if we look at the problem space here in, in cybersecurity for operational technology, right, we think about cyber attacks and its impacts and the, the kind of the arena that those impacts take and it really comes out of the fact that the digital influence that we see in our, in our cyber physical space goes all the way through the control system and into the physical process, right? We're seeing smart sensors, we're seeing all this digitization that now allows it to be susceptible to cyber attacks. And so that helps set the stage for our problem space in, this t in, in today's dynamic, and it's ever increasing, right? And so if we think about cybersecurity protections, right, we see it coming from kind of that IT space into the OT space and into the very heart of the control system, right? We have programmer logic controllers, we have FPGAs, we have all this technology that uses bits and bytes to solve our solutions and to automate, right, for efficiency, for operational gains, for just making our lives easier. And that's not stopping. But there really is an opportunity for engineers to contribute to this space. And what CIE brings into the equation is this idea of engineered controls, where engineered controls are the things that engineers can do as part of their system design, as part of their worldview, to help contribute against cyber attacks. And you'll see in this conversation that we draw a lot of this understanding from how we approach our safety culture, how we have traditionally thought about our safety systems in our, so I come from like the power grid is, is where I'm focusing a lot of my, and so we have protection engineering. But we realize that even our protection systems, even our safety systems are now being digitized. So that allows special consideration to say, as we're digitizing even our safety systems, they are now susceptible to cyber attack. 
So which further necessitates this idea of how, allow engineers to design with digital risk in mind, just as we do when we design for safety risk, for operational constraints, for all these other things that we worry about and perform that analysis against when we're designing our systems. And that's really what the heart of CIE is all about, is taking a hold of what engineers bring to this table. Because engineers are in that special role where they're the orchestrators, the architects of how the process system will achieve its goal. Right, they're the ones that design that algorithm on how the water treatment facility moves the water through the process or how the power grid ultimately delivers power or how oil and natural gas ultimately right, processes oil into gas or into the other fuels that we need. Right, that is the discipline of engineering and they're the, a great resource to tap into when thinking about designing with a cyber context in mind. And so we seek to use those opportunities to eliminate specific harmful consequences. And you'll see, log that in your brain because that'll come important as we start to wrap up the presentation here in a little bit. But this is very much focused on those engineers to help bring them into the cybersecurity culture um, that we're all familiar with because this is a very cybersecurity centric conference. So when we think about the engineering life cycle, right? This is one that comes from the Department of Transportation, the, the V cycle, right? It's built with seven different steps. It pretty well covers the full space. You might have a different life cycle model, but this, this is pretty consistent across the thinking. But when we think about how we approach security nowadays, right? We often apply OT cyber when we're deploying the system, right? That's when we, have the integrators installing the system. Then we start to apply NetSeg, we start to apply access control, we start to apply device credentialing, we start to apply all the cybersecurity practices that we think about when thinking about securing a system. But that's not the time when we want to decide is it effectual? <laughs> is it actually achieving our goals, right? And any adjustment can start to add up the cost. It can start to be costly. So. What we position in the CIE program is if we can introduce security thinking as part of the requirements or the concept or the uh, design phases, we can start to introduce security at the very heart of our system so that we don't have to make these changes later on when it starts to become more costly to make those changes. And if we can achieve that, we can allow engineers to contribute to the successful operation of a system um, in combination with the cybersecurity controls that we're obviously layering on as part of our ultimate solution that gets operated and maintained as part of the O&M phase. So CIE is a, is a last introduction before I get into microgrids. CIE is a built on 12 principles. CIE is a worldview. It's something that it becomes part of who you are and it's something that you then interpret your existence through as an engineer, right? So as we educate engineers in this modern age, this digital age, where as engineers are selecting a PLC and designing an algorithm on a PLC, allowing them to ask the question, what if that, that PLC was affected, attacked, manipulated? What is the effect in my system? And can I use that analysis to rethink about how I might approach that PLC? I still need it, it's still a requirement, but that may necessitate a design change or some additional components to help achieve resiliency in my, in my ultimate operation of a system. And so these 12 principles, right, we focus on that consequence focus, right? What is the consequence of a manipulation of a process variable? What is the consequence of a manipulation of a control variable, right? These are the questions engineers are, are best, they're the role that best answers that type of a question, right? And so they can use that thinking in their ultimate design because we live in a digital area where those type of questions are now susceptible to cyber attacks. An adversary can get in and start to manipulate a process variable because that's being communicated digitally. And so you can start to see how this cyber informed engineering helps address our modern challenges when thinking about system design. 
At the heart of it is, right, is engineering controls. Engineering controls seek to mitigate the impact. That's their relationship in this risk conversation. And that complements well with our cyber questions because our traditional cyber approach is to what? Limit the likelihood that an adversary can achieve an action, right? We put in monitoring, we put in all these barriers to reduce that likelihood an adversary can get to the position to launch an attack and ultimately create an impact. But CIE starts from that premise of saying, given an adversary action, how can I orchestrate the system so that I limit or remove that impact from being achieved? And if you come from that engineering space, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like safety, right? We do that in safety. We put in systems so that given a runaway process, it can't achieve a life safety impact or equipment damage or things like of that nature. But what this does is, is help point that to the cyber arena so we can start to almost take dual credit for the idea of a certain solution might have a safety implication as well as a cyber implication. And so we can start to take dual credit for certain design elements in our, in our system. And that's what engineered controls really gets at. Secure information architecture, this asks the question of giving us a, a monitoring, what is the key data elements that cyber should be aware of so that they can orchestrate their monitoring against those elements of the system? Cyber may not be the best position to help address that dynamic, but right, an engineer who understands the process is best suited to relay that understanding so that monitoring becomes more effective in finding the precursor events, finding those type of opportunities in a system. I'm not gonna review all the principles, just uh, we have linkage to other, our implementation guidance, and you can look up cyber informed engineering to take a deep dive in these principles. But fundamentally, right, all these principles get at the different characteristics that engineers can contribute to the ultimate security of a solution, but from the role of an engineer in complementary nature with the cybersecurity professionals and what cybersecurity brings to the conversation. So in the context of microgrids, because I wanna make this real, make this applicable, show you how CIE can be applied in our process thinking, I will use a, a microgrids as a kind of a use case to help you understand that. But once again, this is just a use case the idea of cyber-informed engineering can be applied to really any engineering discipline that you may find yourself at your organization or your institution. But what are microgrids, right? We understand microgrids are really a collection of energy sources that have been distributed. What does that mean? They've been moved to be more local to its operation, right? Those are loaded terms. They mean a lot of different things, but ideally, right, it's certain energy sources have been brought closer to the load, right? And you often see this idea of distributed energy resources, but the other caveat is that it can be islandable. You can cut it off from the grid and it can still run, still power the load that it's called to manage. And that's really the premise of what we think about microgrids are, is that DER, the distributed energy resource, that's islandable, and that's a, probably the simplest way to think about it. And if you want a more formal definition, I'd point you to IEEE or 62403, you'll get a, a much more in-depth definition, but some is to say that's what a microgrid is. So from our CIE program, we've developed a template to help walk through this thinking, to help operationalize the CIE worldview in the context of microgrid. In order to achieve that, um, we, and I'll, I'll have a link at the end so you can check this out, but how we achieve that, we start by, you can only secure what you know, right? So when you think about a microgrid, right, one of the most common energy sources we're seeing in microgrids is what? A battery system, right? Batteries are one of the chief components that are, that are helping enabling this idea of a microgrid. Because the other energy sources, right, are your PVs, your wind, those transient resources that, that have stability issues just by the nature of what they are. 
So batteries are those buffers that help enable it. And so one of the chief resources that we focus on is the battery system. And when we pull that apart, we start to see there is networks, there's multitudes of networks, there's a site network, there's an internal best network, right? Th that, those networks are used to communicate between the controllers, the battery management systems, the meters, the various components that are helping contribute to the process. But understanding and the challenging thing about engineering is often it's not a one size fits all, right? We try to achieve that with design patterns, but Engineering often relies on the context of where that solution is deployed to, for any nuance that might come out. And we need to respect that when thinking about what engineering can contribute to the security goals of the system. And so once you kind of have a familiarity and selection of what's applicable for your installation, you can move forward by saying, what's, what's the purpose of the system? Why does it exist? Right, I install this microgrid for what reason? Well, I install it for frequency regulation, voltage support, right, or none of the above. I just do it for islanding, right? I'm just there for when the power grid goes off, I turn on this, these energy sources and they supply power. Is that the purpose? But understanding the purpose, right, is critical to your thinking because this is the critical function that you're agreeing the re it's, it's the reason for its existence. Without it, right, I was never gonna build a microgrid without achieving this goal. And so you're making the agreement that this is the goal I want to make sure stays operational, stays resilient, right? In the event of cyber attack, I want to maintain this service because it's the reason why I installed the microgrid. But in our thinking, right, that is the operating mode that we want to orchestrate some engineered controls around. And so moving forward, we select which service we want. So in our case, I'm gonna stick with frequency regulation. And I'm gonna select that these piece of equipment contribute to the delivery of that service. But in order to achieve that, I need to explain how each of those components ultimately deliver that service, right? Well, it can be very tough and that can be very drawn out because, and this is where understanding your certain critical function, your certain service is important because how a, how a certain device delivers frequency regulation may not be the same in how that same component delivers voltage regulation or those various other engineering services that are being facilitated by this microgrid. So it's that opportunity for engineers to help explain, okay, this controller is here to deliver this frequency regulation and how it does it. Well, it's going to maintain that frequency curve over there on the far right, right? I'm orchestrating that controller to control that algorithm. Okay, in this digital space, how is that doing that? So from an engineer, this is how I'm thinking about the system. I'm not thinking about, okay, do I have the right password length? Do I have complexity in my password? How's the network segmentation, right? That's not my primary focus. My focus is on, okay, does my controller adhere to my frequency curve that I need for my solution? But you'll notice a few key points on that frequency curve, right? They're set points. So in this digital age, how am I communicating those set points to you? Well, I probably have a REST API in the controller and I'm sending a put request in there with those four set points. Okay, that's a digital, so cyber can latch onto that. They can be okay. We need to control those four set points. We need to make sure that they don't change, they're not affected, the right person is the one putting them in. So you see the value in that traditional cyber but from the engineer perspective, if that's how I've designed the system, can I also design it to enforce that operating mode? And especially important if I can do it from outside the digital space, because now I have an engineer control that's not cyber vulnerable. And you, start, you now start to see how that safety context is starting to be almost useful and also a cyber context especially as we're starting to rush hard into this digital world where all that interaction is susceptible to cyber attacks. 
But if I can train my engineer to think in that cyber-informed way, I can also include additional protections to enforce that behavior so even if there is manipulation, there's no impact. Because I have techniques I can use in power electronics, I can use various other techniques to help enforce that behavior. Right, because if we see those set points, right, the first set point is when the frequency dips to a certain level, what does that mean? That means I lost load, right? Or sorry, I gained load, so the frequency started to dip, right? At some point, I need to start delivering power because I need to synchronize my generation to my load. And the battery is that special device that I can do both. <laughs> That's why it's such an awesome and, and favorable device in this, in this microgrid dynamic. But the second I do that, the system now knows I need to start delivering power. That's a set point. That then determines a rate. How much power should I deliver? That's another dynamic. And that behavior, that required behavior, becomes a pattern that as an engineer, if I can adopt that thinking, can I develop a system to enforce that pattern? allow that signature to inform how I protect myself from manipulation. Because if the system operated in a different way, I hit a set point and started turning itself into a load instead of a source, that could be problematic. I could go in the wrong direction and further cascade the cyber impact if someone were to manipulate that data stream. So you can start to see how engineers become a key role in how you think about orchestrating against our, our modern issues, our modern threats, because we live in a digital age. So I can use that logic to help focus on um, kind of gearing us up for the next set when we start to think about finishing this, this kind of mental process. Uh, one, uh, as, as we think about the, the service in mind, right, so in this case frequency relation, you always have to weigh it against organizational risk, right, because one answer when we think about cyber-informed engineering is does this mean run a full analog system and a full digital system? Well, that's unrealistic, right, that's not economical <laughs> to think that we're going to have two complete grids out there, we're going to have two complete systems, and we'll just jump over to each one based on some context. That's often unrealistic, so we want to target our solutions, and we want to really probe, is it worth pursuing this, this service because we see this service as having sufficient impact to warrant this additional investment or warrant this, this opportunity for engineered controls. And so in this tool, you have the opportunity to kind of weigh that decision. Is it higher than my organizational risk acceptance? So when you think about now a service being important, I want to achieve that consequence analysis from both the cyber and the engineering side. So in our CIE implementation, right, we've developed about 1,152 different questions to consider. What I'm suggesting is don't go try to eat the whole elephant in one bite. There's some key questions that really help get at the heart. And you'll see it in the tool. Right, from an engineering perspective, you can ask, what are the limits of acceptable degradation in my process system? So you can see in that frequency regulation, what's that limit that I'm willing to allow the frequency to dip to? You can think from a safety, right? We always put our safety requirements just past maybe our operational requirements to help put that hard limit. This allows us to introduce maybe a secondary limit where what is that cyber limit that we're willing to allow degradation to? But that's an engineering question, right? Engineers can best think about what is that acceptable degradation for this specific component in that system. Where a cybersecurity professional would ask, what would it take for a attack on this equipment? What would be required for someone to pivot all the way to the inverter? or to the controller to help contribute to the impact against frequency regulation. All right, so you can start to see how both, this becomes a team sport, right? Both cyber and engineering are starting to move to that same goal of protecting the system. Right? And it helps show that cybersecurity really is a team sport 
in this day and age. It's not just cyber professionals' role, it's an organizational goal. And then from that consequence analysis, you have the opportunity to analyze for mitigation. Once again, I pull key questions to help think about or probe for how you might design mitigations against a certain component in the larger goal of achieving a certain service in the microgrid. So questions right from like engineer control are their analog or physical protections engineering the system where possible, right? As we continue to digitize, there's still reason to harvest where we've came from, right? We don't wanna repeat our, our past by ignoring our past, right? We have hundreds of years of engineering to draw from when thinking about orchestrating a resilient system in this modern age, right? And we start to pull the idea of like active defense. How do you actively defend? What's the role of the technician, the operator in understanding precursor events? Are they trained to recognize precursor events? To further explain this becomes a team sport when you start to introduce the operations and, and engineering support and your cybersecurity goals. But all this comes down to is ultimately delivering it in an ideal way, engineered controls to help contribute to the security of a system. So we can think about, right, my battery curve. That's a curve I designed my battery management system to adhere to, right? Can I use certain dynamics of that to help inform power electronic design so that I can have a characteristic in my power electronics to enforce the max voltage that I'm required to see. Right now I have a control that's not cyber that helps contribute to ensuring the operational pattern that I'm ex expecting and not just relying on a piece of software to be the only control which may or may not be sufficiently susceptible, right? Because it, some of that's being mitigated by cybersecurity practices but once again, right, CIE is operating from that premise of given an adversarial action, how can I reduce or eliminate that impact? And so you can see how both those camps ultimately contribute to a much more robust risk conversation in your system design. The engineers, we can use our pattern that we're already designing the algorithms to to help inform how we might redesign the system. And then when I talk about the frequency curve, right, I point to a, a, an arc, a, a Rokoff relay, a rate of change of frequency relay, right? We use these relays in a protection mentality. Maybe opportunity to take a dual credit for that, that that's operating in both a safety context, a protection context, as well as a cyber context. And that conversation is one that can hopefully improve your conversation with compliance with auditing, with those type of things, because you can start to bring that in as contributions to the overall security of the system. That you may not have taken before, right? But special consideration for when those, those devices are also digitized, right? I think about our digital substations of the future, right? I think about a server rack, and rather than having a protection relay, you just have a software protection relay with a network cable to the circuit breaker. Or that's, that's almost like as digital as you could ever get. But given the effect of that software, could you also make sure that you have systems in place to reduce the impact so that you're not tripping things off when they're not supposed to be tripped? Those type of things that often come out of a cyber attack. Or, right, can I use the expected behavior as part of my logic that I achieve with my power electronics or with my control, right? I, if I suspect that I hit a certain low frequency set point, I should start delivering power. That should be a, a thing by which you can put through and logic to ensure that be, that pattern is important. Be receiving power at that moment that's fundamentally not part of your operating mode. So why not make that part of that engineered design so that it's fundamentally not possible, so that any manipulation in that direction at a minimum can be detected, but two, in an ideal world, can be not even made possible by the way the system's been engineered. 
And that's really what that, how CIE can help contribute to the overall protection scheme of our modern day systems. So finally, and this is the last slide before we get into some questions that you guys might have, is when we think about the overall risk conversation, right, impact times likelihood, where likelihood has been kind of sp spidered out to vulnerabilities, exposure, threats, all the different measures we're using to help quantify cyber risk, right? We, traditional cyber is all about reducing the likelihood, the majority of it. I realize some practices focus on impact like recovery, backups, those type of things. But at the heart of cybersecurity is reducing likelihood to a point that it's unlikely an adversary can get to a point to create an action. But engineers now have the opportunity to help emphasize impact reduction so that given an adversary action, engineering can remove or eliminate or mitigate the ultimate impact that be, can be achieved. And you can see how both those now work together to have a very strong, very effective risk conversation that further increases that defense in depth that we're all trying to achieve as part of our objectives of traditional cyber, right? But you can see how this becomes a, a I hope my goal is that you can start to appreciate kind of the next generation's engineer's approach to this conversation because everything is being digitized. And so it's by the fact it's being digitized in, allows it to be susceptible. It's not guaranteed susceptibility, it's a measure in there, right? But it's susceptible nonetheless. There's bits and bytes involved. So with that, I think we're ready for questions. And I've got the QR code if you wanna go check out that Excel sheet that kind of explores the CMAT concept. Uh, we're, we're strategically growing this to include a lot more energy sources. I'm about ready to ingest all the cybersecurity controls into it, so you have both the engineering and the cyber control selection in that tool. But more to come, but this is kind of the, the first exposure to this tool to public, so we're open to feedback. So with that, I'll stop for questions. Okay, yeah, and Tom Duffy here. Um, can you define the difference between OT security and cyber-informed engineering? Yes. So when I think about OT, my definition of OT is the marriage of IT and ICS systems to achieve a goal, right? In a modern system, you have your traditional ICS devices, your PLCs, your smart sensors, your, your actuators on that side with your IT style components, your servers, your HMIs, your personal desktop computers that are, that are delivering a software to achieve a, a, a process goal. So operational technology, that's how I think about it. So then the cybersecurity of that is the security of the digital aspects of that system. Where CIE now says, how can engineers contribute to the process design, the algorithm design that that process system is facilitating in its operation? So cybersecurity bolts onto that and achieves your device credential management, your access control, your net seg, your all those, how we, how we naturally interpret cyber protection thinking. But then CIE is that, that last mile effort of, okay, how can the engineer contribute to the cybersecurity goals of that? Oh, nicely explained because um, for those people who are familiar with the safety and security pyramid, systems engineering is at the top. Yes. So shout out to engineers. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions? You almost made me look, lose track of time with all those schematics up there. I was really studying those. Yeah. I think I saw a Wheatstone Bridge in there, but it might have just been w wishful thinking. Yes. Okay. Come on, he's leaving soon. This is your last chance to pick his brain. Ah, here we go. 
My name's Abby. I am a cybersecurity architect, predominantly IT by nature. Mm -hmm. I have been thrown into the world of OT in the past five, six years, and there is a massive gap, yes. long story short. And one of the hardest things to do is to have that level of communication. Number one is that we don't have a level of communication, same words. Mm -hmm. They're actually probably the same device, the same something. If not, the device doesn't even exist in the IT world, really. Yeah. So they call it a widget and we lose track and value of what OT actually delivers to IT and vice versa. So in bridging that gap, and it seems that CIE is, this is the first time I've heard of it, to be honest. Um, how do you bridge that, have that conversation, vice versa? Um, IT can be stubborn, <laughs> um, but as an architect, it's our job to go ahead and make the orchestration of all devices since most of the, no, most, if not all, of the delivery of the services, boots on the ground, physical, comes from OT. Yeah. That has been, I can't say been um, necessarily ignored, but it's been an island on its own. The microgrids, things yeah. of this nature, now are being tacked on to digital. Ergo, Purdue model. Yes. All of these fun things, yes. IEEE, you know, yeah. IEC 6443, yeah. amazing. And depending on who you listen to here, you, you get the concept of what to do. So long story short, how do we reach out to folks like you who understand the concept? It sounds like there's not very many. I, I think it's, so for me, part of the wake up call was the fact that it's not just, uh, what's a good way? It's not just picking a power supply anymore. It's realizing the power supply comes with a network cable that I can connect into to harvest information from. Not all power supplies have that. Some power supplies is just a simple raw signal, right? Four to, four to 20 milliamp signal in, but I'm using that as an information source, right? To help inform a decision. That decision, I, as an engineer, I get to decide how it's used, why it's used, where does it go to help contribute to why it's used, how it's used. And as part of that, that starts to become a digital thing, right? It, it, it's the second it comes into a PLC, it's a, meant, the second it goes through an ADD converter, it becomes a cyber problem. That's my belief. And if engineers can understand that, they can, they're the best resource to help answer that for you. You're not the best person as a cyber to necessarily answer what's the implication of this value being changed. But if, if it'd be like, you are the best person, so help me help you type, dynamic, but if engineers can appreciate the fact that 99% of what they do now is a digital experience, that should become part of the digital risk management that should be at the heart of their solution because we're already trained to think about risk. It's just safety risks, it's operational risk, it's environmental risk. We're starting to, as part of the CIA program, introduce the concept of digital risk evaluation as part of a core element to your engineering thinking and your trade-off analysis. Um, because right now, engineers don't do that, right? They just select the PLC because that's gonna achieve their goal, but they're not selecting it and addressing, okay, what if this was manipulated? They're not called to do that, but they're the best ones to help you answer that question. So you can bring the question, but then give them the opportunity to answer it. And right there, you can start to see a, a, a collaboration that may not have happened before because your goal is just to achieve it and they feel like you're just a, a impediment to their operational goals. But if you can start to help them see that, no, I, want to, I want to protect your operational goals, but I need your understanding to best do that. And that, that, I think, helps the marriage, so. Yeah. And I'm sure the willingness to ask the question and say how can OT and IT and engineers communicate is the first step. Yeah, so if you guys go into CIE land and you look up CIE, that's why our implementation guide is all questions because we, we want to come with that kind of questioning attitude as the best way to bring people together rather than being prescriptive, saying, thou shalt do this, and now you're CIE. It's, let me help you in the sense of, you're the best resource to help us achieve our goal. So, 
we need to work together. So I can't, I, as, a, as a cyber guy, I don't have that understanding. I have the understanding to make sure it's highly unlikely an adversary is going to be able to manipulate that value. But if they, if they do, tell me which values I need to know are the ones that are like the most important and any manipulation them will cause a safety issue. Those are the ones I want to know. How are we on time? We actually have three minutes. Okay. Three minutes and thirty-five seconds. Oof. Looking so. good. Looking good. Yeah, my flight's at four thirty. Is that good? I don't. Oh, and you're in Houston. Yeah. You should have left yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Do I? Okay. Beam over there. You need a personal drone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's let him go. Give him a big Texas goodbye. Thank you.